Lovely, and thank you very much. So I'm here to talk to you about what's changing, what's new. I'm going to do this in 15 minutes, and many of you will be aware there's quite a lot that's new. But before I start, I'm going to counter the Please Buy My Book plea with a Please Help Our Organisation plea. Our political influence belies our tiny status. We operate out of a terrace house in the West Midlands. We have four employees, one of whom is an apprentice, and we are facing an existential crisis. So if you're thinking of doing some fundraising over the next few months, please do consider the Sepsis Trust in that. Ah, that one. So, some of you will have seen this before, the slide of Aston Villa Football Club. And some of you will have heard me say that Sepsis now claims more lives than bowel cancer and breast cancer and prostate cancer put together. And that's almost certainly true, but it's equally true that some of those lives claimed by sepsis will have sepsis as a result of chemotherapy for breast cancer, anastomotic leak following bowel reception surgery, etc. And it's also true that if you stood half a dozen lobbyists up in a line talking about their individual condition, myself included, the combined number of deaths we claim would exceed probably the national annual mortality. But nonetheless, sepsis is a big problem. So where do we get these data from? Well, we get them, amongst other places, from the Health and Social Care Information Centre via the hospital episode statistics. And it's climbing. And you can see at the bottom, 123,000 cases or episodes of sepsis in England in the last recorded year, being 2013-14. So if we extrapolate that across the UK, and if we assume that the incidence hasn't risen further, <coughs> then we're talking about 150,000 episodes every year. And we know from NCPOD and other studies, the mortality in England is 30%. The Scottish Government published their mortality at 24%. And the Welsh Health Minister, Vaughan Gethin, has recently announced mortality from sepsis across Wales at 20%. We don't know what Northern Ireland are doing, so we'll assume that's the same as England. But therefore, we come at 44,000 lives claimed every year, of whom an estimated, and a strengthened group of term estimated, 12 to 1,500 deaths are in children, like William Mead. I also want to think about, before we come on to how this impacts on antimicrobial stewardship, what happens to survivors? Because some survivors, like this young lady, will go on to return to what, for them at least, is relatively normal function. But the reality is that many people aren't so lucky. This is just one slide of many I could show, but it highlights that there's a significant incidence of moderate to severe cognitive dysfunction following an episode of sepsis. I could show you another slide showing 22% incidence of post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, we're health professionals, and we like standing in rooms like this appearing clever, and we like to talk numbers and statistics, and we like critiquing papers. But what does this mean? This means the young woman who survived sepsis, who can't look after her children, any longer safely, who might not be able to return to work, not, might not be able to care for their children, whose relationships stretch. Sepsis affects lives not only when people die, but also when people survive. And it's particularly prevalent, these long-term complications, with the delayed diagnosis and the need for admission to intensive care. We've had some recent reports. NCPOD, the National Confidential Inquiry into Patient Outcome and Death, an independent body doing a narrative report based upon voluntary submission of data from about 85 to 90% of British hospitals. And there's a number of themes emerging. What do we know about sepsis? We know now that it is what we suspected all along, primarily a community-acquired problem. More than half had sepsis for those whose data were available, a minimum of 53% of cases had sepsis at the arrival at the front door of hospital. The vast majority, nearly 80% there, came in through the emergency department. So this is not primarily a problem of healthcare-associated infection. This is primarily a problem of community-acquired infection, delayed presentation to the healthcare team, and inappropriate communication frequently between members and organisations within the healthcare team. We would hope that our hospitals would recognise septic shock reliably, but this slide again from NCPOD shows that that's not the case. Now, I arbitrarily drew a line at four hours. I thought it should be reasonable to expect a healthcare organisation, an acute trust, to recognise a patient with septic shock within four hours following emergency department admission. We do it in about 60% of cases. So we know interventions fall. Now, this is what's really relevant to stewardship. 
It's which of this cohort of patients need antimicrobials and who needs an urgent care. We have this old paradigm that we all know to be relatively untrue and a bit naive, that it's a gradual continuum and if we don't intervene at one step, then the essential result will be the next step. When we look at the mortality rates for each cohort, and sepsis is probably, uncomplicated sepsis is actually a bit lower than that now, it's around 8% in most studies, but the mortality rates for each cohort fairly powerfully persuade us to want to intervene early on. And when we have statements like for every hour we delay an intervening in septic shock, the risk of death goes up by 7.6%, I can see why I started to receive care pathways from organisations saying, forget severe sepsis, we're now intervening at uncomplicated sepsis. And this worried me, and this worried a lot of people around me. Because we don't even know, of course, that these people even need antimicrobials. And just as Bill Gates unscrewing this lid off a jar of mosquitoes and releasing them into a TED audience of 5,000 people saying, why should the poor people have all the fun? If I were to inoculate all of you with white polysaccharide, a handful of you would become moribund within a matter of hours. A handful of you would uh, progress along the continuum nice and slowly and predictably. But a significant proportion also would have a relatively benign self-limiting illness, depending on the inoculum that I provided. And the reality is we don't know who's going to respond in what way, therefore we still have a blanket antimicrobial policy. So, back to this. What are we going to do about it? Well, the problem is that not everyone comes to us with purpura fulminans and profound septic shock. Most people come to us slightly unwell, perhaps talking, perhaps not triggering on the national early warning score. And it's these people we need to understand who to treat and who not to treat. So mindful that the prior that set of international consensus definitions, and apologies for the map to PC formatting there, but prior to this week, the official definitions based on this complex battery of laboratory and physiological investigations, and the only people we were spotting were those who near patient testing could identify, those with high lactates, those with severe physiological derangements, and this was clearly not good enough. So, slightly better than back of a fag packet, but a little bit like back in a fag packet, we spoke to the Royal Colleges, spoke to NHS England and said, we need to sort this, we need a pragmatic solution. We came up with red flag sepsis. Based on the bedside criteria from the international consensus definitions, joined with the parameters that score three on the National Early Warning Score. And this has been in place for 18 months now. But now we've got two new recognition strategies. One was released yesterday at the critical care conferences. And it suggested to us that of those criteria, of those red flag criteria, four had significant evidence base behind them. So they're calling this school the QSOC school. The problem with this new international bedside definition, and the reason that NICE and the Royal Colleges are uncomfortable with it, is that it's another aggregate score. The thresholds are very low. For example, the threshold for a spiritual rate is 22. It's not been proven in the community, and it needs two criteria to be present. And so we're uncomfortable operationalizing this and considering how it can be applied across the healthcare system. So this is what NICE are doing. This is the draft guideline, so I should strengthen that this might change in July, but I think it's unlikely to change significantly. The recognition strategy will look a bit like red flag sepsis with NICE. Blood pressure, largely unchanged, they've just changed the mean to drop. Lactate, unchanged as a trigger for intervention. Heart rate unchanged as a trigger for intervention. Respiratory rate, that's what, unchanged. Oxygen saturations, 91%. Well, we've now done a bit of BTS on that, and it needs oxygen to keep the saturation at 92. Response to voice or unresponsive, again, unchanged. Papyric rash, unchanged, but a little bit of addition in the narrative to what mottled skin might look like. So essentially, nice and looking more at the red flag sepsis than the new international definitions. But every professional group I speak to, and I'd be interested to hear views after this session, believes that a patient presenting with one of these criteria warrants at the very least urgent assessment, if not warrants a blanket prescription of antimicrobial source control, intravenous fluid, blah, blah, blah. So managing sepsis, well again, not much has changed here, and this is very brief. This is the current international consensus guideline for managing sepsis. But the problem is, we can forget the bottom bit, because there's now been three international studies that disprove early goal-directed therapy. They don't disprove the 10x, that we need to fill patients up and give them vasopressors and think about the cardiac output. 
that they disproved the protocol, saying that standard care is now as good as using that protocol. So we're left with a bit of this off. Measure the lactate, take some samples, give some antimicrobials, <coughs> and give some fluid. Samples. These are the three studies that discredit the way you the therapy. And what we're left with, really, is that source control, antimicrobials, fluid resuscitation, and vasopressors in non-responders are the only things that are proven to be of any benefit in patients with sepsis and septic shock. We know from international data that, again, the earlier we give the antibiotics, it is severe sepsis and septic shock, the greater chance the patient has of surviving. So it's difficult for me to say that we should do anything other than recommend blanket antimicrobials until we understand how to individualise care based upon host response. So we're left with the sepsis 6, basically, which has been in place in the UK for a decade now, has spread to other countries and is in use in 95% of British hospitals. And it's gradually evolving over time. Just to finish, we're very guilty in healthcare of likening ourselves to the airline industry. We're very guilty of thinking that checklists and protocols and formality will resolve things. But of course, what these patients need is frequently clinical judgment. Now, we're as guilty of this as anyone. We produce clinical toolkits, we give blueprints for what good care might look like, and the latest we've produced is one on paediatric sepsis. The Secretary of State, who I met again yesterday, is taking a keen interest in this. And we are, I can assure you, doing so cautiously. We are considering a public awareness campaign, but this will be dealt with in a piloted fashion, with testing and with caution. We are considering replacing the sequin for sepsis in time with something better and more formative like best practice tarot. And we are working very closely with William's mum, Melissa, who again was there at my meeting with the Secretary of State yesterday, who will not rest until we have fixed this problem. So I accept it's imperfect, but we are going to have to face the fact that the public will be more aware of sepsis, and this is one of our public-facing education programmes that we're about to launch. We have to face the fact that the GPs and pharmacists and other practitioners in the community will be delivering safety netting, and these people will be presenting to us, both adults and children, thinking they have sepsis and challenging us to prescribe them antimicrobials. Is that wrong? No, I don't think it is, provided we have the um, confidence to confirm or exclude the unlikely risk of sepsis and withhold or prescribe early antimicrobials. Just to finish, if we were to get this right, then we would save a lot of lives. 80% compliance with the sepsis 6 in patients with red flag sepsis, according to studies in this country and abroad, would save 10,000 lives in England, up to about 14,000 lives across the British Isles. And that's, of course, the same as stopping anyone dying from bowel cancer every day, and surely worth doing. Now, in the interest of transparency, I'll share our own data. This is from my little DGH, and this is our ICNOP mortality. Now, NCPOD showed us that only about 50% of patients with sepsis in hospitals require intervention in intensive care. When I say sepsis there, I mean severe sepsis and sexual shock according to the old criteria. We're dropping the of severe sepsis with the new. Our mortality with the eye of faith is, I think, below the international base, uh, below the national mean. But of course, it only takes these are small numbers. It only takes one or two unexpected deaths, which we see, to pull it above average. So what we've got to do with sepsis is not to blame organisations if their mortality is outside the national mean range, but to encourage them to examine, to look at whether it's just poor data, whether it's bad luck, or whether their systems need improving and comparing with systems of other organisations. And I think the only way we're going to do this robustly is if we have a national registry for sepsis looking at the entire patient journey from the community through the hospital and longitudinally into survival. Only then will we understand. So there we have it. That's what saving 14,000 lives look like. Every one of those people in that stand is a person like you. These aren't statistics. These are people with children, with mothers, with brothers, with aunts, with uncles. Sepsis comes into people's lives like a car crash, and if we get it wrong, it destroys those people's lives. And when we have gold standard mortality in the best institutions of the world at 9%, and our UK mortality at 30%, I would say we're now failing a lot of people. Thank you very much.